Most high net worth individuals I know understand that they need a trust, but they don't quite understand all the benefits or the process of setting one up. And so whenever I have a consultation with a client, I've explained all the benefits trusts have to offer. Inevitably, their question becomes, how do I set up a trust? And that's why I created this video. In this video, I'm going to explain trust setup processes step by step the same way I would explain it to one of my clients. Let's get started. Before we get into the process, I'm just going to go over trust basics really quickly. If you want a more in-depth analysis of what a trust is and how it functions, check out my video, Introduction to Trust. First of all, a trust is set up by a settlor. And the way a trust is set up is the settlor transfers property to a trustee for the benefit of beneficiaries. The settlor takes his property and transfers legal title to the trustee. So the trustee then owns and controls and administers those assets on behalf of the beneficiaries pursuant to the trust agreement or trust instrument trustee they call it different things in different jurisdictions then you have the beneficiaries and like i said the beneficiaries are those who are going to benefit from the trust and the trustee has a fiduciary duty to manage the assets for the benefit of the beneficiaries now an optional additional party that you can have in a trust is called a protector and a protector can be an individual or an entity and it's generally appointed by the settler when they set up the trust and then you can build in different procedures for replacing the protector along the way but the protector generally has certain powers removing and replacing the trustee or approving distributions we'll talk a little bit more about the protector later i just wanted to briefly mention that the possibility of having a protector exists if you like our content please don't forget to subscribe to our youtube channel by clicking that subscribe button we'd really appreciate it and for more strategic tips on international tax and wealth planning Subscribe to our email list and follow me on LinkedIn. Links below. Step one, the very first thing you need to do when you're setting up a trust is determine what you hope to achieve with the trust. You need to clearly identify your estate planning goals, your succession planning goals, whether or not you want the structure to be multi-generational or not. You need to determine your asset protection goals, your privacy goals, what tax benefits you hope to achieve, and things of that nature. And you have to sort of prioritize them because sometimes it's a trade-off between one benefit or the other and you need to know which one needs to take priority in which situation. So step one, define what you hope to achieve with your trust. Step two is then determining who's gonna benefit from your trust. So who the beneficiaries of your trust are gonna be. So a lot of times it's gonna be yourself, your spouse, your children, your bloodline family descendants. But depending on the jurisdiction, it can basically include anybody, right? So you can put other relatives in there, friends, charities. Some jurisdictions do have some limitations on who can be beneficiaries of, say, a family trust or something like that. But in general, you have very wide flexibility in naming beneficiaries to your trust. Step three is determining the distribution provisions. How are the beneficiaries going to benefit from the trust? You generally have three different distribution provision types. So we have fixed distributions, right? So let's say you have three kids, you make them the beneficiaries, you say, okay, each gets a third of the trust. These are fixed distributions. I'm generally not a fan of fixed distribution provisions. With a fixed distribution provision, because you're assigned a specific interest in the trust, a lot of courts and tax authorities will look at that interest that you have in the trust and treat it as an asset of yours, which means it's attachable in the case of liability. Tax authorities will attribute income to you based on that beneficial interest. So you can do fixed distribution provisions, but they're definitely not my preference. Then you have discretionary distributions where you say, okay, these are the beneficiaries of the trust, but it's up to the trustee to decide who gets what, when, and how much. This type of trust provides the most asset protection and tax protection. You can also have a combo where you combine fixed distributions with discretionary. So for example, you can say, well, it's a discretionary trust, so the trustee decides who's gonna get what, when, and how much, except for when each beneficiary gets married, they get $100,000. This is sort of a combination of fixed and discretionary, and you can do a combo setup and still maintain those tax benefits and asset protection benefits so long as it's set up properly. Let's get into step four. Step four is determining how your trust is gonna be controlled. So for example, are you gonna use a professional trust company? So a trust company that administers trusts as their business or 
Are you going to do a private trust company that's managed by family, friends, professional advisors, or a combination of the above? Then you need to decide what powers the trustee has. Do they have the powers to add and remove beneficiaries, for example, or the discretionary power to distributions? Or can they exercise these powers, but only with the consent of the protector, for example? So you need to really determine how the trust is going to be controlled, what powers the trustee has, and if they're subject to any checks and balances, like the consent of a protector. And then, really important, you need to determine who the successors are going to be. If you're using a professional trust company, you need to decide what happens if that trust company is not doing what is expected of them, what happens if they go out of business, how is the successor name? Probably where this becomes even more important is in the context of a private trust company where you have a board consisting of family, friends, trusted advisors, stuff like that, because you need to determine how those board members on the PTC, how they're going to be replaced. So for example, is the protector going to decide who replaces the trustees or the board members? Is the outgoing trustee going to name a successor? Or the beneficiary is going to vote? There's really a lot of options, but this needs to be planned through. And which is the best option often depends on your unique circumstances. Step five, also very important, is like I said, determining whether or not they're going to be a protector. And if there is going to be a protector, how is the succession going to work? Is the protector going to name their successor? The beneficiary is going to vote on a successor? There's a lot of different options. And what power is the protector going to have? Some very common powers, for example, are the power to remove and replace the trustee, the power to approve distributions, the power to approve amendments to the trust agreement, the power to approve the addition and deletion of beneficiaries, approve the migration or termination of the trust. There's a lot of different powers that the protector can have, but you don't want to give the protector so much power that they're undermining the trustee because that can then cause some other problems which is beyond the scope of this video but just know that protector provisions need to be drafted carefully so that they're providing the checks and balances to make sure that the trustee is doing what they're supposed to do and that they have the power to remove or replace the trustee if need be but without giving the protector too much power that they're undermining the trustee it's a delicate balance and needs to be planned properly. Step six, choose the best jurisdiction for your particular situation. For many Americans, a foreign trust might not be the right answer. They might want to stick with a domestic trust. Certain jurisdictions have restrictions, for example, on who can be beneficiaries. So if you want beneficiaries to be beneficiaries of your trust that aren't allowed in that jurisdiction, that's not an option. Certain jurisdictions only allow professional trust companies, not private trust companies. So you kind of need to look at your situation and then choose the right jurisdiction for you. That's very important so that you really get the trust you want that works like you want with all the benefits that you hope to achieve. Step seven, determine which assets to transfer to your trust and the tax consequences of doing so. A lot of times when you transfer assets to a trust, there could be gift tax implications, inheritance tax implications, there can be gains on the transfer. So you need to analyze on a case by case basis. We need to look at where you're resident, where the assets are located, the provisions of the trust, and then determine the tax consequences of transferring these assets into the trust. Sometimes there's no tax consequence, but we need to analyze it before the assets are transferred. Also, it's really important to look at the types of assets that you transfer to your trust, investments, interests in businesses, things like that. Great things to transfer to your trust. Vehicles, and I mean, unless they're expensive collectible vehicles, probably not such a great idea because you change vehicles usually quite often and there's a lot of liability attached to vehicles. You would not want to contribute those types of assets to your trust, the ones that carry a lot of liability or the ones that you use personally on a day-to-day -day basis. Step eight, fund your trust by transferring assets to it. So a lot of people mistakenly think that a trust comes into existence when it's signed. Not true. A trust comes into existence when the settler transfers assets to the trustee. So you have to put something in your trust to bring it to life, even if it's a dollar. Properly funding your trust is a very important step in the setup process. And then once you start transferring other assets to your trust, you need to make sure that they're properly retitled. If they're not retitled in the name of the trust, then a lot of times they will not be treated as being in the trust and you'll lose a lot of the benefits associated with having those assets in a trust. I've been helping clients 
plan and set up their trust for almost two decades. I'd welcome the opportunity to show you what we can do here at the Esquire Group. So please contact us if you need help structuring or restructuring a trust. You can contact us at info at esquiregroup.com or www.esquiregroup.com. Thank you.